I mean, they essentially killed their current generation Intel models. If you're even thinking of buying one of those, like, don't. But here we are at it again. It's 4 a.m. iPad Pro is broken. Let's uh, try to make a good video this time. All right. Okay, so last week I did a video comparing the Mac Mini to my nearly $9,000 Mac Pro. Boy, did you guys have a lot to say about it in the comments. Now in this video, it's not going to be a versus in the sense of, you know, can this computer replace my Mac Pro? Because as hundreds of you pointed out, a computer that costs an eighth or nearly 10th the price of your main machine probably isn't going to replace it. So I thought it'd be interesting to see if the M1 MacBook Pro could be a good companion to my nearly $9,000 Mac Pro. This video is gonna be primarily focused on video editing, but towards the end of the week, I'm gonna be releasing a day in the life of the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1, where I showcase all things battery life, productivity apps, basically just in everyday use. So that's gonna be the most real world scenario of how this computer holds up. And so definitely make sure you're subscribed so you can be notified when that video comes out. So if I could reach through the screen right now to you holding both the Mac Pro and the MacBook Pro, which one would you prefer to have and which do you think would better suit your needs? Hit the like button for the MacBook Pro and comment down below and tell me why for the Mac Pro. And also let's see if your answer changes by the end of this video. All right, so let's check out the competition here. In this corner, we have the 13 inch MacBook Pro M1. This is the base model with an eight core CPU and GPU, eight gigs of unified RAM, and 512 gigs of upgraded storage. Now in the other corner, we have my 2019 Mac Pro. This also is the base model eight core CPU and has a combined 24 gigs of graphics power between the 580X and the W5700X from Apple. It houses 160 gigs of RAM, a 256 gig internal SSD, and a added in two terabyte NVMe SSD. I have eight Thunderbolt 3, two USB type A, a headphone jack, three HDMI 2.0 ports, and two 10 gig ethernet ports. And of course, everything internally, fully customizable and upgradable in the future. And on the MacBook Pro, we have two Thunderbolt 3 ports. Oh, and a headphone jack, can't forget the headphone jack. All right, so let's talk performance. And real quick, we're gonna start off with the Mac Pro because we've talked about this before. Now, in order for this to be a true companion app, I didn't wanna dumb down projects. I don't want to be like, oh, this is a project that I can do on the laptop while the bigger project works on the main machine. I want something that I can, you know, maybe start on my Mac Pro and then, oh, I have to travel or I'm just going out for the day or I just want to change scenery and go outside and edit for a bit. So I can throw it on my T5 SSD, plug it in and have no problems. The way I have my Mac Pro set up, I can with ease edit all of my 6K Q5 or Q0 raw files from my Blackmagic Pocket 6K, set up on full 6K timelines, playing back with color grades, noise reduction, multiple layers of video and sound design without any real problems. Export times are usually around 20 to 30 minutes for the average like 13 minute 6K YouTube file. And I have no problems multitasking, having Photoshop open to work on the thumbnails while a video is being rendered out. All of these tasks leave plenty of room in both the RAM, GPU and CPU. Again, for my setup, the only project that I've worked on that really kind of pushes it to the max is what I showed off in the last video, which was a music video with about 11 layers of red 8K helium footage. So now let's talk about the performance of the MacBook Pro in comparison. So plugging in the same project that I set up on my Mac Pro, scrubbing through the timeline is surprisingly really easy. I honestly thought it reverted back to a 1080p timeline, but nope, this is the full 6K timeline that I'm scrubbing through and it's doing fantastic. And that brings us to our next point, 
The only way I can get consistent playback on the 6K timeline is if I turn off all of the color grading, including the noise reduction, which honestly is still very impressive. If I wanna keep the color grade on and watch it back, hitting the real time at 24 FPS, I'm gonna need to go in and change my timeline resolution or just create optimized media like proxies or render out the cache both of which are perfectly fine options, just gonna take a little bit more time. When I first started testing here, I literally, you know, started editing for about 10 minutes, just adding some clips, moving things around, seeing how it felt. And then I started doing an export and I got about 15% of the way through before I stopped it, just cause I was done seeing how it was performing. And the battery did not drop a single percent. Usually on a laptop, if I even open an editing program, you're down like 3% just there. And if you actually start editing hefty files, you hear the fans start to spin up and you got maybe like 45 minutes or an hour. But this thing is amazing. I'm gonna dive way deeper into the battery life in the full day in the life review that will come at the end of the week because I want to see some more consistency with the battery life before I give my definite opinion on it. And that leads us to exporting and multitasking. Now export times on this computer, understandably, are a lot slower where my Mac Pro renders out in around 20 minutes or so. Uh, this guy is looking at around an hour 45 to two hours. Um, it could be a little bit faster or slower depending on what you're doing. But what I wanted to check out is if I set it up to render in the background, again, the 6K timeline, I was fully able to open up a photo editor, mess around with that, open up YouTube, watch a video, and the user interface just continues to be snappy. Now, when I check back on Resolve, just like I did with the Mac Mini, I did notice it start to slow down even more and basically allocate resources to the new tasks that I was doing, which is going to slow down the render times. And this is where having that 16 gig model, I think definitely would show a decent amount of performance boost. And so if you are doing tasks like I'm showing off here, I really think that 16 gig is definitely probably going to be worth the extra 200 bucks in the long run. But overall performance of this computer, honestly, like I, I'm kind of in love. Can the base model MacBook Pro 13 inch M1 be a great companion laptop to a $9,000 Mac Pro? Yeah, this thing is awesome. Once again, I have to give kudos to Apple for not only creating an awesome computer, but really keeping the price points competitive. I mean, they essentially killed their current generation Intel models. If you're even thinking of buying one of those, like don't. And so while I am genuinely impressed by the performance of this computer, there is still a reason and a market for computers like the Mac Pro. And just because you may not be that market, doesn't make it a dumb purchase or a dumb machine. Again, thanks for watching guys. Uh, huge thanks to crossing 25,000 subscribers. It's absolutely mind blowing. Thank you to each and every one of you. And if you watch this and you're not subscribed, it hurts my feelings. So I'll make you a deal. If you're not subscribed, leave a comment down below. And if I respond to you, you have to subscribe. Deal, handshake, handshake. See you guys in the next video.